All right. Hello again. Welcome to Return of Macarthurism? Question mark. A special program brought to you by United Chinese Americans and U.S. Heartland China Association. My name is Min Fan. I'm the executive director of U.S. Heartland China Association. I am honored to turn this event very soon to the president and founder of United Chinese Americans and Haipei, who will moderate this event. But before we do that, let me turn to Governor Bob Holden, our chairman. Governor Bob Holden, you can unmute yourself and to give you opening remarks. Governor Holden, you need to unmute. Governor Holden. Here you are, go ahead, please. Okay, Th thank you very much, Min. I'm delighted to be with everybody today. Uh, in, in thinking about what I wanted to say to, to all of you, I came across the quote from Mark Twain, history never repeats itself, but it rhymes. And how true that can be not only for centuries and decades, but also yesterday and the day before and on down the line. So. History does repeat itself. It does rhyme. We do have you know, conflicts internationally. We, we've got paranoia, Cold War versus hot war. We have country differences, whether it be France, Great Britain, China, Russia, uh, South and Central America, all across the board. And what we want to uh, talk about is how do we find the common ground? How do we understand that we must be able to communicate and work with each other if in fact we want to see a, a world go forward and be successful. We have two outstanding uh, speakers with us today. Uh, Larry uh, wrote the book on McCarthy. He's written several other books. Uh, all the work is extremely uh, authenticated uh, so that you can see exactly just how how in depth he does in his work. In addition, uh, we also have one dealing with uh, an area that I'm comfortable with and know about, and that's Monsanto. Uh, and uh, Mara, she's written that book, which is an extreme, extremely good book too. So we have two great authors today who are gonna talk to all of us about the past, the present, and the future where it needs to go, what we need to do, what changes need to be made. And I'm looking, looking forward uh, to all of it because this is a time that our country and our world needs to sit down and figure out how we can work together to keep our world safe, uh, our environment uh, clean or cleaner than it is, and how we can provide an opportunity for the next generation to, to take the mantle and truly be leaders to help solve the problems around the world. So let me turn it over to, to Larry so he can start the, the real discussion of, of this day. Oh, sorry, Governor Holden, just to jump in really quickly, I'm gonna actually turn to um, our moderator, Haipei. And so thank you, Governor Holden, for uh, your remarks. Again, given your recent recognition as uh, inducted into the Missouri Public Service Hall of Fame. And we're, uh, we're delighted that you can join us. Um, really quickly, Haipei is one of the most prominent Chinese American uh, activists and champion. He founded the United Chinese Americans. And I'm honored to turn this to Haipei to lead us through this discussion and featuring two um, prominent writers on the topic we all care about. Haipei, the podium's yours. Hi, Pei, please unmute yourself. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, welcome everybody. And it's uh, such a uh, lunch break time and uh, everybody uh, uh, join us for this event. Uh, nothing is more timely than, uh, than this talk, uh, I would say. And just uh, recently, as recent as yesterday, the New York Times has an article about uh, 
the, the uh, political atmosphere in Washington, D.C. Uh, that remind people very much of the 50s and uh, the McCarthy um, era. You know, I myself um, um, is uh, uh, a overseas, uh, like a foreign student coming from China in the 80s to study in the United States. That was a very welcoming time and is a quite a market different from today in my own life. So I, 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 I was totally unprepared for this uh, new face of our country. So um, I would, you know, in, uh, today we will have a, a dialogue uh, quickly between Larry and Mara, and they will introduce their work for, for us. And then we will have some discussion and followed by, uh, by question and answers from the audience. Uh, Larry, I guess uh, the floor goes to you first. Okay, great. Um, so most of our discussion today will be about what is going on with McCarthyism today, but I wanna set a little context and remind people just who Joe McCarthy was. And I wanna start out by saying that I wrote probably the 101st biography of Joe McCarthy. And one question anybody who looks at the book should ask is why the world needed the 101st book on Joe McCarthy. And I wanna say that I had access to, um, for reasons of luck and being a pain in the neck and persistent, I had access to three kinds of materials that we had never seen before on Joe McCarthy. The first was all of his personal and professional papers that his widow left to his alma mater, which was Marquette University, shortly after McCarthy died. And she left them with a provision that they would become public when their infant daughter said they would become public. And for 60 years, she was saying either no or nothing, or when she died. And she was younger and healthier than me. So I didn't hold out much hope for those papers. But one day I got an email from the archivist at Marquette saying that she had decided for a reason none of us were sure to open up all the papers to me and the day I stopped looking to close them again. I also had access to 9,000 pages of transcripts of all the hearings that Joe McCarthy held behind closed doors. And two thirds of the hearings that he held were behind closed doors. So suddenly we could look at what McCarthy was really saying when he thought nobody was looking. And the last set of papers were showed up in an enormous brown box at the foot of my driveway in Cape Cod one morning when I was on the way out for a walk. And those turned out to be thousands of pages of Joe McCarthy's medical records showing how he lived his life and that he died of something very different than we knew about. So the bottom line is lots of new material. And what it all said was that Joe McCarthy, as bad a guy as we thought he was, we didn't know the half of it. And now we do. And as much as we had speculated that he had died of hepatitis, he in fact died of being a drunk. And for much of his career in the Senate and for all of his last years, he spent more time being drunk than being sober. And I think that explains a lot about who Joe McCarthy was. But I wanna take you back with me for a minute, if you would join me to a place called Wheeling, West Virginia, when Joe McCarthy launched the crusade that we're here to discuss today. And Joe McCarthy showed up at a very important event every year in the life of Republicans across the country. It was Abe Lincoln's birthday and Republicans all over America get together every year to toast Abe Lincoln, to raise money and to remind one another why they are Republicans. And prominent Republicans, if you were the president or you were a prominent senator, you got invited to deliver the Lincoln Day dinner in places like Washington or New York, like Chicago or LA. When, Joe, when you were Joe McCarthy, a backbench senator who looked destined to become a one-term senator, you got invited to Wheeling, West Virginia. And he showed up there that night with an enormous briefcase. And he had two speeches in his briefcase. One was a speech on national housing policy, 
which was something he actually knew a bit about. And had he delivered that speech that night, 70 years later, there's no way we would be back here talking about Joe McCarthy. But instead, he reached deeper into his briefcase, and he pulled out a sheaf of papers, and he held them up in the air with great drama. And he said, I have in my hand a list of more than 200 spies at our very own US State Department, and I'm going to name names. Now, what he in fact had in his hand that night might have been his wife's grocery list. It might have been some recycled set of documents from somewhere in Washington. But what we know today and what we know from seeing his newly unearthed private and, pers uh, and professional papers is he didn't have any names of any communists that weren't known to the government already. But what he did was within a day, he was on page one of every newspaper in America. And he suddenly went from being a backbencher who knew a little bit about housing and not a whole lot about anything else, and certainly nothing about communism. He went to being front page news in every newspaper, first in America and then around the world. And he never looked back. And what this suggests is that Joe McCarthy was the perfect opportunist he knew how to grab an issue that was hot. He knew how not just to say, I have a number of communists that I think are infiltrating our government, but he knew that it was much more dramatic to actually name names. And if this starts to sound familiar in terms of anything that's going on in our world today, it ought to be because lots of today's demagogues and the demagogues that followed for 70 years took their blueprints from Joe McCarthy and understood that all you really needed was a good ability to give a good speech. You didn't need facts. You didn't need truth. And I think that that is where we are left today. And I want to um, stop talking until we get to a discussion about today and turn it over to my wonderful co-panelist, Mara. Hi, Mara. Uh... It couldn't be more uh, appropriate that uh, Mara can follow that historical, uh, that history with the echo of our contemporary time. Mara's, uh, she has extensive experience um, in China and working on the China Initiative and have tracked some cases and as some as, as recent as uh, last month's trial um, in Tennessee, uh, on the professor, I mean, who uh, amazing uh, piece. Uh, Mara, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you. It's good to be here today. Um, what what Larry just said about, about um, Joe McCarthy waving documents into the air and, and, you know, how that's a way to kind of attract attention, whether or not what you're claiming is true. Um, it makes me think of how FBI Director Christopher Wray says, uh, you know, every few weeks, it seems that the FBI is opening an investigation into China every 10 to 12 hours. Um, and, you know, each time he makes headlines for that claim. And I, I always wonder, like, you know, what does that actually mean? Like, are there a picture agents in headquarters in the dead of night? Uh, opening an investigation at like 10 p.m. Um, but, um, you know, that's a good example of, of a claim that every time it, he makes it, it, it is reported as, as news, um, even though he's, he's made it many times. Um, so I uh, got interested in the in investigations uh, into Chinese scientists when I um, was working in China as a correspondent for science. Um, I ended up writing a, a book called The Scientist and the Spy, um, but initially I was, you know, based in Shanghai and um, suddenly seeing the this beat that I covered um, you know, be, uh, make headlines in the U in the U.S. and and kind of trying to figure out what was going on. Um, you know, what the end, what I ended up putting together ended was a sort of look at the years leading up to the China Initiative, and then some of the history 
underlying um, discrimination against Chinese scientists in the US uh, and problematic cases um, that go back decades. Um, so I focus in particular on one case uh, which took place in the Midwest. And so, you know, maybe of interest to, to many of you. Um, it involved a man named Mo Hailong who was accused of stealing corn from Monsanto. Um, you know, when I initially read about this case, um, the reports said that he had been caught like red-handed in a cornfield outside Des Moines, um, that these trade secrets represented by the, the corn, the genetic, genetic modified corn, um, were a national security um, issue of national security importance. Um, the U.S. government had, in fact, used um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is supposed to be reserved for um, terrorism, issues of extreme national security importance, um, though it's abused. Uh, they use that, they use FISA in this case. Um, there were car chases, um, the FBI flew surveillance planes overhead at one point. And so I um, got interested in you know, why all of this work was done um, to in pursuit of someone who was accused of stealing corn. Um, and I'm, I'm from the Midwest as well. I, it was like a natural place for me to return to and go report out this book. Um, but the pattern that I found in that case uh, played, has played out in, in many other cases, um, you know, where investigators pull out all the stops, all of these tools, um, even tools that would normally be reserved for um, cases of extreme national security importance um, and, and, you know, effectively treat defendants um, like terrorists. And there was at that time already, um, this is pre-China initiative, um, but there was already a lot of rhetoric being thrown around. Um, you know, Ray was talking about how the FBI had a thousand uh, investi investigations involving China and trade secrets theft in the work. Um, prosecutors would give press conferences where they would use very hyperbolic language, um, you know, comparing people to foxes in a hen house. Um, the media coverage was often fraught as well. Um, you know, I saw reports where defendants were likened to um, animals, you know, so it's sort of like locusts in a swarm, this sort of language um, was fairly pervasive. And I, 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 we can talk a little bit about this later. I think media coverage has improved somewhat, um, but this was, this was a big problem even going back um, five or six years ago. And um, uh, the case that I look at in the book, um, there's no question that Mo Hailong was in that cornfield, um, that he, you know, did, did attempt to steal corn from Monsanto. And so it's a little bit di different from some of these cases, um, like those of Xiao Xixi, or Sherry Chen, um, where, you know, the government threw the book at somebody and they turn out to be completely innocent. But nonetheless, um, it, he was subject to a three-year FBI investigation. Um, there, the FBI bugged his vehicles. They dug through his trash. I mean, by looking at what happened to him, um, you get a sense for um, you know what what goes on in other cases. And part of the reason I chose this case was because of those unusual details of the, the degree of surveillance, you know, the, the, the fact that the FBI flew um, uh, airplanes overhead um, to, to track um, Mo Hailong. Um, but another reason um, was, you know, similar to the reason that Larry chose his topic, um, there were just hundreds and hundreds of pages of court documents available in the case. Uh, and that gave unusual insight um, into what the government had done um, in, in order to try to build its case. Um, and like many recent cases, um, and like you know, cases going back back 10 years as well, the government came out, you know, alleging alleging everything short of 
of espionage, you know, alluding that that he had um, committed some grave grave crime. Um, he was charged with economic economic espionage, and you know, in in the end, um, he oh, hang it. He and in the end, he did he pleaded guilty, um, but the sense was far less than the than the government had sought. And, and you see that pattern um, playing out in other cases as well. Um, so at, I'm just gonna quickly um, wrap this up, but I, as part of um, the research for this book, I wanted to understand um, the history of um, decision-making within the FBI and the context um, feeding into these cases. And what I found was, um, I placed a Freedom of Information Act request and eventually um, got documents showing that there was a dedicated program to surveil Chinese scientists in the 1960s and 70s. Um, it was fairly widespread. Um, the aim was to, uh, was to compile an index of of literally every ethnic um, Chinese researcher in the United States. Um, this was under J. Edgar Hoover, um, appears to be his idea, um, but the surveillance continued into the 70s and the 80s, um, and then you know, to a lesser degree in the decades that followed. Uh, I, I wrote about that as well in, a, in an article for The Intercept, but some of that is in my book. Um, and, so that, that pattern of um, assuming that people were guilty because of their ethnicity um, did continue into, um, you know, into the Wen Ho Lee case um, and into the, the late 2000s and to the cases that you see today. Um, so I, with that, I am excited to talk about this further with Larry and, and also to address questions that you all may have. Yeah, thanks, Samara. Um, since that our topic today is the return of McCarthyism question mark, um, I guess uh, I kind of want to ask you both that: Do you think that McCarthyism has come back or not? Uh, it could be in light of uh, the politics uh, of our country in the last few years. And it could be, uh, you know, Mara, you're in Europe, and there's a lot of uh, nationalistic movement in Europe too, uh, with some very colorful characters. Or in terms of uh, how uh, our own government has conducted its uh, um, China issues, uh, including prosecution of Chinese American scientists. Uh, what, what do you think? Is it, is it coming back? or it's almost back, or it's already back, or it's a total different. Maybe I'll just jump in quickly. I wanna read you, if I could, two quotes. And one quote is that candidate Donald Trump um, issued in 2006 when he boasted to his, uh, to his supporters, I quote, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. Maybe the most mm -hmm. famous line in the 2016 campaign. Exactly 62 years before that, the most famous pollster in America, George Gallup, said this about Joe McCarthy and his supporters. And I quote, even if it were known that McCarthy had killed five innocent children, they would probably still go along with him. Now, yeah. I think it's not accidental that in a hundred ways that we could talk about, but that I don't even need to talk about, that Joe McCarthy was channeled by Donald Trump um, and continues to be. We all know probably that there was a, an arrogant and brilliant young attorney named Roy Cohn, who was Joe McCarthy's protege. And exactly half a century later, was Donald Trump's tutor. And he was, Roy Cohn was the flesh and blood connection between Joe McCarthy and Donald Trump. Donald Trump instinctively got what made McCarthy a success. He knew he could wave sheafs of paper in the air and talk about 
all of America's troubles being immigrants pouring in from Mexico or trade secrets going out to China, and nobody ever would bother catching up with the facts of what was going on. It was just making the charge and his supporters and enough of America would believe him. And I think it is scary, not just that Donald Trump has managed so successfully to channel this, and not just that he managed to be elected president doing that, but that yesterday in elections in Virginia and maybe in other places around the country, Donald Trump protégés showed that they can do something similar and win election. And it didn't go away when Joe Biden beat Donald Trump a year ago. It's still around. McCarthyism never died with Joe McCarthy, and it hasn't died yet with Donald Trump. What an indictment. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Larry's comments made, made me think of, his comments on Trump made me think of um, this committee for the present danger that um, yes. Steve Bannon and others started um, a, a few years back. I, I don't know the status of it now, but you know, right. I remember looking at the, the rhetoric of that committee and the whole framework and it, it, it felt like it was um, like it was straight out of the, out of the sixties. Um, so, you know, in terms of what happens um, when cases against Chinese scientists are brought, you know, at the, at the very granular level, I think it's often not, um, it's, it's not uh, so that there's such a great conspiracy or anything like that. Um, but you have, you have FBI agents um, in you know, every field office around the country who have been tasked with um, finding instances um, of China stealing uh, American technology. And so they go out often with not a lot of information and are then, um, you know, told to find perpetrators. And the, um, there just is not a lot of, there's not training on um, bias and the people that they very often come back with are ethnic Chinese. Um, and, you know, I've heard again and again um, from like, for example, I reported at um, MD Anderson Cancer Center um, after the FBI spent 18 months on campus. There are, they actually still were on, on campus um, grilling people at the time that I started reporting there. And they just created this atmosphere of fear um, where, you know, there were several people who were under investigation for not reporting um, uh, ties to China. Um, but the, their assistants and the people they worked with were also inexplicably put on leave. Um, and all of them were ethnic Chinese. And, you know, it, it, no one was ultimately charged. It may have been the case that there were people who had their um, grant filings, you know, not all, um, all like neatly filled out. But the, when, you, when the Bureau goes in and, um, you know, puts a dozen or more ethnic Chinese researchers all on leave. Um, it gives this scrutiny, it, it gives this feeling that they are under scrutiny um, because of their ethnicity um, when many, many have, have done absolutely nothing wrong. That, well, we, uh, many of us know about that case. Um, what, um, uh, what I'm curious about is, uh, um, you too, um, when you look at these uh, cases, look at um, what has happened uh, in our country in the last few years, um, do you uh, see that um, uh, how uh, FBI or law enforcement uh, during their, their work, doing their daily work, is how, how is that different from uh, from in the 50s uh, when Hoover is still there as director or how, how much improved or well, what's your view on our law, law enforcement uh, um, way of doing business today, especially regarding um, uh, in, the, in this case, as Mara have mentioned, the uh, Chinese American scientists. So Mara knows a lot more um, on how to answer your question, but I'm gonna take a quick 
stab at it. And the um, so it would be difficult not to improve um, FBI enforcement of the law from the Hoover era because it was so seat of the pants and depending on his um, personal biases. But I think one of the things that I see as a through line from the 1950s to today is in the 1950s, it was assumed that anybody whose politics were at all left of center um, were by definition stealing secrets and giving them to the Soviets, that they were traitors. They weren't just, so it became um, enough of a, um, a scarlet letter to just have politics that were left of center that even today, 70 years later, lots of politicians in America hate to call themselves liberals for fear they're somehow be branded as that will flow over into their being a socialist or a communist or being disloyal. And I think the same scarlet letter is applied to a lot of people of Asian American ancestry or scientists um, who have any ties to China that that is somehow being seen as um, melding quickly into somehow being traitorous. And I think that the um, there were real leftists who were stealing secrets in the 1950s, but by the time Joe McCarthy came along, any of the 24 carat ones had already been in, uncovered. And one person joked in 1950 that if Joe McCarthy were dropped into the middle of Moscow's Red Square on May Day, he wouldn't recognize a real communist. And I think that was true. And I think that the, that the um, incredible um, vitriol that people used in that era to label people communists without evidence is the kind of thing we're seeing today. And it's not just among Republicans, and it is um, certainly affecting an Asian American community, but I've exhausted the extent of my knowledge, and now we'll hear real facts from Mara. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so similar to what you say about uh, there were there were leftists in in the 50s who um, uh, who were spies, right? So the, I see in the chat people asking, does China steal technology? And um, are there, is it a conflict of interest when, when um, people are collecting US grant money and also um, collecting money from the Chinese government? Um, there, there are genuine issues here. Um, you know, the, the problem is in how they are addressed and how the FBI um, and the NIH um, go about um, fixing those <laughs> issues. Um, and, you know, one significant problem at the FBI is that it's not um, very diverse and um, they have also managed to alienate the a um, Asian American um, agents that are there. Um, I, you know, I spent some time talking um, to people who, who told me that they were, um, they were told um, not to date Asian US citizen women, um, not to um, hang um, lanterns uh, at Chinese New Year, like not to have any kind of culturally um, significant um, items in their home. And I mean, this is just so, this was the attitude within parts of, of the FBI. And so you, to have this organization that's not very culturally literate and um, that can't, um, you know, adequately distinguish between people honoring their cultural heritage and um, people being somehow unfaithful to, um, to their national, to the U.S. nationality, I think is is it, that's a major issue, and when you have those kinds of pre-existing bias in the organization, it does shape um, it does shape the way they investigate cases. Yeah, hi, Pete. Can I just jump in with? Um, yeah. There's yeah. really wonderful stuff going on here in the chat, and I just want to. Um, yeah jump on two issues that were raised there. One is the question of whether Joe McCarthy had a chilling effect in the 1950s that we even see some of today in terms of um, people, um, experts in our government on Asia. And 
I think they were called back then, those experts in the State Department were called this wonderful shorthand expression, China hands. And they were the experts on China and on Asia generally in the State Department. And they were purged under Joe McCarthy. They were, um, lots of them were called leftists. They were said to be too sympathetic to um, Mao and the, um, and the red Chinese who were taking over and they were purged. And for a generation, we suffered ill effects. Now, it's too simplistic to say we got into the mess we got into in Vietnam because the Asia experts were missing from the State Department. But having said it's too simplistic, it also is true in part. And the people who knew Asia and who could have seen the subtleties of what was going on in Asia then were all out of the government. And it took a generation generally for the State Department to gear up again and if that sounds familiar, it's because during the Trump era, lots of people were purged from the State Department. Either life was made uncomfortable enough for them or just generally working for the government was seen as being an evil enough thing that lots of good people left the government. And I think it will take a while for us to restore that kind of expertise and credibility. I want to say one other thing, and I want to say it especially because Mari is here today. The, there was a question raised earlier in the chat, what about journalists? And aren't they the ones who have to sift fact from um, specious charges? And I think if in the last four or five years there have been any heroes in America, it have been the journalists. I'm not talking about journalists on the, um, in the crazy cable shows who are partisans one way or the other. I'm talking about working real fact-based journalists like Mara and like the Washington Post and the New York Times. And they have been out there every day with fact-checking, with scouring, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, what they say and what really is substantiated. And I think that we don't spend enough time, we spend a huge amount of time today disparaging journalists and don't recognize that these are people like Mara who are working crazy hours. She just was on a deadline two seconds before she came on with us today. They're doing it under very difficult conditions made worse by COVID and they're doing it, and I don't know what her salary is, but they're generally doing it for very little money. And they're doing it because they believe in something called the truth. And they're what separates us from real threats or even worse threats to our democracy. Well, let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Um, uh, what, what has changed? Um, uh, for one thing, I can say that um, I totally agree with you, Larry, that uh, I, I, I'm so um, happy that you see that. Uh, I'm not so sure how many people out there uh, see that, that uh, our media uh, this time around, I'm, I'm not talking about just the last few months, but actually starting from the courage, uh, coverage of uh, Sherry Chen and the Xiao Xing Xi, um, the New York Times and Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal are, uh, it's really very, very encouraging actually. Um, and, and that little newspaper uh, in Knoxville, uh, also played a very important role um, to go through every day and do the reporting, something I can hardly imagine in the 50s. So maybe I was wrong on that, right? Um, uh, so what do you think have changed uh, in terms of uh, journalism, in terms of maybe our, even including law enforcement, including uh, you know, our judicial system uh, or our just in general, some politics, uh, are we more tolerant? Are we more sensitive to um, to to minority uh, communities? Uh, what are all the change are there? Well, I do think there's been a change in the past few years um, in terms of how this particular issue is covered. Um, when I started looking into it, um, there uh, it was pretty rare that journalists would reach out to the defendant in the case when someone was charged. Um, or, you know, I mean, maybe they attempted to contact their lawyer, um, but I honestly could not find any uh, examples of defendants who had told their story um, until Xiao Xin Xi came along. And, uh, you know, 
between Wenhuli and Xiaoxingxi, um, there was almost nothing. There was um, a um, white professor at the University of Tennessee who had been getting, get, given a whole um, kind of spread in Bloomberg after he got out of prison for, um, uh, you know, allegedly taking to technology to China. Um, so and that that was it. Um, and I, I think you know now journalism is in like other areas has been in this reckoning um, over, you know, prioritizing uh, white voices over other voices and, you know, trying to broaden our, um, our sources, um, trying to also, you know, increase the number of, um, of people of color who are working as journalists. And um, all of that's just happened in the past um, in the past two years, and hopefully is having some positive impact. Um, but at the same time, as people have noted in the chat, we're at a very low moment um, when it comes to U.S.-China relations. Um, you know, that's something for which I don't think the Trump administration. I think it bears a, a significant amount of um, responsibility, but I, it's also, uh, in my view, a, a factor of um, of a more difficult situation in China and a, a more um, assertive position um, in international relations. So you have these two countries kind of um, increasingly at loggerheads. Um, and I'd be curious to hear from Larry how that played into um, McCarthyism in the, um, in the 50s and 60s. Sure. So I wanna just say about um, journalism, it was journalists who were, um, the people who brought down Joe McCarthy. There are a lot of people um, who claim to have done that. There were various senators. There was President Eisenhower, um, but it was really journalists. They, from day one, um, knowing they'd be kicked in the teeth, and he did kick them in the teeth, um, then, like today, journalists were the good guys. And back then, it was mainly, um, sadly, guys. Um, and to me as a lifelong journalist with journalism being the closest thing I think I have to a religion, I'm glad to see that journalists are doing the same thing today. And they were kicked in the teeth by Donald Trump and others, but they get back up and keep doing that. But I wanna say that my book, while it is a biography of one of the most vile characters in American history, it is at bottom a good news story. And the good news is that demagogues, be they Joe McCarthy or Donald Trump, Americans sadly still buy into them, but eventually we see through them and we do away with them. And I'd like to think that someday we won't buy into them in the first place, but it is very encouraging to me that we're discussing Joe McCarthy in the past tense and as somebody who had a very steep downfall and that much as he would like to come back to power and we'll have to wait three years to see whether he does, we're discussing Donald Trump, the demagogue as the ex-president Donald Trump and he's being investigated by journalists all over the world in terms of things. And it just, we don't always get things right but in the end, it seems like we come out right and I hope that that continues to be the case. I kind of still want to like to go back a little bit um, into history while uh, Larry is here. Um, you know, in the in the fifties, we have something called a Red Scare. Um, we have talked about this um, in private. Um, I think uh, at that time, uh, Chinese community has um, had its share of that that Red Scare. Uh, some of the Chinese has been investigated without good reasons. Uh, some in the Chinese community has been harassed, some uh, being expelled, some have been detained, uh, all of that. Um, I, I'm not really sure there was one Chinese spy has been found by our government. Now, so is the larger Red Scare, which is mostly actually um, uh, you would look at a real person and their ethnic background, many of them are Jewish. Um, and, and that red scare um, and with some kind of targeting on Jewish community, uh, that's where 
you kind of easier to profile uh, things like that. What is, uh, I, I don't know whether during your research, Larry, uh, or and for the same matter, Mara, um, is, is there any similarities in, in, in how that two community has gone through um, uh, or so, why were it made easy target? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I wanna start by saying that Joe McCarthy was an equal opportunity slanderer. Um, he slandered Jews and too many leftists and Jews. And after the Rosenberg um, famous spy case, um, it became easier for him to become openly anti-Semitic. He was anti-gay. He was anti-Russian and he was very much anti-Asian. Um, but any group that he saw uh, as vulnerable, as lacking the political clout that he would pay a big price in taking them on, he took them on. And there is the lesson today. It is groups that um, politicians see that they can scapegoat and blame for everything that goes wrong. So for the last four years, um, when we did anything from lose a trade secret to develop a pandemic, it was easy for Donald Trump to point the finger and say the same thing. It is Chinese Americans, it's Asian Americans, it is outsiders and foreigners. And he understood from all the demagogues who came before how that works. And for all the people that will say, geez, that's unfair, you're labeling a whole group and you're doing it without evidence, it didn't matter because the next day he'd come up with a new outrageous charge and the press would be hard pressed to go back and look at what he said the day before because they were trying to keep up with his latest tweet. And he did it more effectively than Joe McCarthy because McCarthy had to wait for the next morning's newspaper. Donald Trump could stay up all night and be tweeting and every journalist who I knew who was covering him said they never got any sleep because they were afraid to go to bed because they'd missed some new outrage. Yeah, I guess I would, um, yeah, I would like to say something about the difference between espionage and economic espionage and grant fraud, um, because I think this, these are often very, these are very often conflated um, by US intelligence officials um, to in, inflate the threat um, from China. Um, you know, I think with, in terms of espionage, um, it is true that we're in a moment of US Chinese, Chinese tension and that China, like the US, has a very sophisticated uh, intelligence apparatus. Um, they rolled up the CIA's network in China a few years ago. Um, there are concerted um, attempts to spy. Um, where um, it, this all goes too far is that economic espionage, um, theft of trade secrets, and um, lesser crimes like grant fraud, um, you know, uh, leaving out information on a grant in a grant application, um, for example, these have all gotten um, kind of swept up under the same umbrella as espionage. Um, and, you know, I appreciate Larry's um, um, owed to journalists earlier, but um, journalists often fail to distinguish um, among the three. Um, so when you look at like the trade secrets theft, um, the case that I featured in my book, um, very often what's happening in these cases involving corporations um, is that the U.S. corporations are very large companies like Monsanto, um, which was then a U.S. corporation, um, it's now owned by Bayer. Um, have an interest in bringing uh, in bringing charges of um, trade secrets theft against scientists at rival companies. And so effectively what the US government has done has taken on um, the interests of large corporations. It's helping them um, advance their own um, IP battles. And at the same time that, um, fight has, has gotten kind of swept up in this rhetoric of we're being tough on China. Um, when you actually dig into many of these corporate cases that have been brought, um, you know, they may involve a, a defendant who's ethnic Chinese, 
Um, but there, the, there's no clear tie to the Chinese government. Um, there, you know, even in a case um, like the one I wrote about where um, the person pleads guilty, it's still not clear that this is about some, you know, that, that deep down, this is really about some um, deep seated threat from, from China. And um, similar, similarly with the grant fraud cases that have been brought under the China initiative, um, you know, it, there are many instances of researchers who have failed to report ties, um, but like, are they agents for the Chinese government? And that's a very, that's just, um, all, you know, the, the, the rhetoric that gets used um, sort of suggests that, that they are. And that's where the problem lies, um, that you have all of these somewhat minor, you know, still federal crimes, but more relatively minor offenses when you compare it to um, extreme issues of national security, like espionage, and they're getting kind of swept up under the same umbrella. Yeah. So can I say one quick thing? I'm seeing that um... Uh, there are two sets of questions that are coming up in the chat that I'd like to address. One is that Mara and I are biased mm -hmm. and that we're from the same side of things. And the other is the question of what can be done today. And I'd like to discuss the bias and what can become, uh, be done today in what I hope will be a very brief answer. Um, so we are biased and I think we're anti-demagogue, um, not necessarily um, anti-Republican. And I wanna just go back for a minute to history. Joe McCarthy was a Republican and the Republicans helped enable his rise to power, but they also did him in in the end. It was not the Democrats who brought him down. The Democrats showed a surprising lack of courage in taking him on LBJ, who was the head of the Democratic Party in the Senate at the time, said, we're not going to, you know, go at him in a frontal assault. We're going to wait till Republicans are willing to go after him and then we'll help them. And that's what happened. It was Dwight Eisenhower and the Republican Party in the end that said to Joe McCarthy, you've gone too far and that facts matter and the truth matters. And I think today it's not Republicans that are demagogues, it is Donald Trump and his acolytes who are, and I think someday, and it may be in three years or it may take longer, the Republican Party, the same way it did in 1950, will reclaim its better nature, will say that truth matters again, and we will again have two parties competing based on facts rather than on scapegoating. And being anti-Trump doesn't mean being partisan. It means being anti-demagogue. Well said. Um, yeah, in terms of my own perspective, um, you know, I was a journalist in China. It's really not an easy place to, to be a journalist, to get information. Um, I you know, to this day, uh, cover human rights issues. I cover the expansion of surveillance technology globally, including in China. Um, when I started this book, I had no, um, I was just interested in, uh, you know, I'd spent a lot of time uh, with Chinese scientists in China um, because I was then a uh, correspondent with science. And I was interested in why suddenly um, all of these indictments were being brought. I didn't have a foregone conclusion. Um, and I actually, I did spend a lot of time uh, with the FBI um, talking to the lead agent on the case that I wrote about. I made, I mean, went to national security conferences. I made every effort to talk to the people, the people on every side of the issue. Um, you know, the only, the only people who would not talk to me for the book were, were, uh, executives at Monsanto, to be honest. Um, and so the this is the conclusion that I reached after looking at all these angles, was that a lot of these cases uh, were overblown. And, you know, that's my own conclusion, but I'm, but I'm just giving you a little information on how I got there. Yeah, you know, Mara, uh, uh, I, I have always had some problems with our uh, a law called economic espionage. I think that needs to be and must be uh, sooner or later to be amended. Um, 
for those stuff you you don't know um when our government says we have charged this many cases uh who are spying for china things of that uh there's a there's a category within the economic espionage law that actually does not require uh, perpetrators to to be supported uh, by the alien governments or uh, with the intent to help uh, a foreign government. So it's, it's a mom and pop uh, operation. Uh, and you know what? Most of the cases of these Chinese uh, espionage, uh, economic espionage cases are filed under that category. So if you take that on, I don't know why that category is there. Uh, if you take a serious think, economic, the E word, uh, espionage E word, you to not associate the two things together. So anyway, that's a more yeah, technical yeah. thing. Um, yeah. So right when you when you, if you look back to when the law was passed in 1996, I think the originally it was envisioned as as um, the U.S. government would bring cases where there was a clear connection to foreign governments, um, but it just hasn't played out, and they have not been able to um, keep let those charges stick. Right. Right. So. You um, actually, Larry, already you took my topic just now, and I, I'm glad that we didn't uh, um, um, in your previous around uh, to delve into that. Um, what what I think what we all are interested in here is um, uh, when things like this happening around us here in other parts of the world, in Europe, I don't know, maybe even in China. Um, what can citizens or NGOs like UCA, like uh, US Heartland China Associations, what can we do? Uh, what, what kind of uh, historical um, uh, precedents that you think um, we can take a page from today? So I think there are three things we can do. One is we can read and learn. The second is we can vote. And the third is um, even more important than voting is we can be activists and speak out on things that matter. And we think that we're more divided than ever today, and it's really difficult to do that. But that's just forgetting our history. We were incredibly divided, and things were vituperative, and everybody was angry at one another back in the 1950s during the Red Scare and the Cold War and all of that. And the lesson was that it was not journalists and not the president who ultimately decided the fate of the demagogue then, it was the public. And that is why the public gives politicians the confidence to do what they ought to do. It, it is us who can do all of this. And that sounds um, maybe naive and it sounds um, maybe too optimistic, but it worked and it's worked. We have had demagogues throughout our history, starting in the days of the um, American Revolution, and we've had them continuously. And in the end, the people always prevail. And I'm convinced with a little help from some journalists, they will do it again. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and just to expand on what Larry said, um, you know, I think great journalists have done we've done our best, but um, it really has really been the activism of the Chinese American community that has brought this issue onto the stage. Um, and I think that is part of the reason that the narrative is starting to shift. Um, you know, when I reported my book, I really benefited um, from people like Hai Pei um, taking the time to educate me about the issue, um, you know, so in my effort to talk to people on all sides and, um, you know, learn as much as I could about the issue, um, I, I also spoke with people just, I, I, there was a lot that I did not know about the history of anti-Asian racism and, um, you know, just having those discussions was incredibly helpful and, and I think that, that has, has also been um, a, a big reason um, that um, you know more there's more awareness of, of some of the issues in these cases. So can I just do a quick last shout out? Um, I did a shout out to Mara in journalism. I want to do one to Bob Holden and good people who go into government. And people not being afraid to do that really matters. And I want to do a last shout out to UCA because you've 
Um, you're probably going to get a lot of blowback from some of the people who are on this session saying, why do you have biased speakers like this? But I yeah. think you're not afraid to take on That's an issue the, like that. Um, Chinese organization, that it's a Chinese group that is, um, well, hang on. Well, what's going on? Go, go ahead, Larry. Anyway, no, I was just, I've, I've said it, and I think that you're a courageous organization um, to take on controversial issues that sometimes seem partisan, but that's not the controversy. The controversy is against fact and lies. And that's, that's what the issue is. And that's what you help bring the truth to issues like this. So thank you. Well, thanks, Larry and Amara for that. Um, um, actually, when, uh, when the Sherry Chen case broke out, when uh, the government has dropped uh, her charge, uh, and we we went we went to the Capitol Hill and did some events and uh, in supporting of uh, a clear one hundred percent clear cut case, uh, we still got some uh, some people complaining. Oh, she must have done something wrong. Otherwise, why government would be interested in her in the first place? Things of that nature. Um, um, I I really see that you know despite of all this. Uh, uh, gloom and uh, we we are seeing there's a lot of old tactics coming back um, and the US China uh, really we probably going to have be prepared for a very very long haul uh, of um, a total confrontation between two countries I hope that's not the case but if that is the case and then that even more most likely will be the case uh, there will be a lot of more uh, developments like this, there will be more demagogy. I, I can bet my house on that. Um, but I see the positive signs to uh, nonprofits, NGOs come up much stronger compared with the 50s, right? I would say that, Larry, right? Um, and our, as you said, our media, uh, our reporters are are so much better. I, I would have to say, I the the really. In, I, I'm personally really very much impressed and very grateful for what I have been doing. And I think uh, even in terms of makeup of US Congress, uh, where uh, you have a very powerful kind of KPAC, Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which has played a pivotal role in many of these cases and, uh, and in Washington politics. Just about three days ago, uh, KPAC has met with uh, Attorney General Garland and his deputies. And these, in during these cases, these talks, uh, they have pressed uh, China Initiative and others, right? So we do see some progress. And, and there's also some very brave African-American member of Congress, Jewish American member of Congress who stood up on our behalf. Uh, so if you see all this, you still see some hopeful signs and the progress uh, our country has come along. Um, and in Boston, we just elected Michelle Wu mayor. Oh my that's Lord. not a bad, uh, that's a pretty extraordinary is, thing. Is, that, is this uh, bringing politics into this? It or is, no? absolutely, <laughs> it is. But, uh, yeah, and there are, I mean, I think you can see also, um, um, you know, we, rep we report on um, the FBI fairly, fairly extensively at The Intercept and um, there, uh, the, the China initiative and the treatment of Chinese American scientists is, is sort of in its own category. Um, but at the same time, um, the FBI has labeled um, black activists, um, black identity extremists. Um, and, you know, so there's this, there is this tendency that goes beyond just um, uh, Chinese Americans to um, kind of categorize people and discriminate against them. Um, based on race and ethnicity, uh, and and so uh, you know I think it's it's also important to understand that larger context. Right, and Larry, you want something to say? Oh, just a last word from me is read Mara's book. It is not just reading journalism, but reading people um, when journalists have the time um, to go deep the way you do in a book. Um, read her book. <laughs> Well, we have uh, some uh, time for some questions and answers. Uh, I don't know whether um, either uh, Fan Ming or 
Chi Hong, you have some, yeah, I, I, we, we see some uh, hands raised, right? Um, could we, uh, do you know which one we should go next? Um, we'll give our audience some, some time. Um, yeah. You should, let's see. Um, there's a participant BA and you should be able to speak. Go ahead. We will let you. Yeah, please go ahead, speak. Please yeah, raise you. your hand. Please unmute yourself. While we wait for her to get ready, there is a question about. Um, okay. Oh, you ready? Please go yes, ahead. Yes, yes, yes. My question is thank you very much. I know everybody's talking about. Uh, uh, the racial profiling for the scientists, but I also realize uh, under China Initiative, you also have other uh, people who's not uh, scientists, but also possible uh, being racially profiled. I I just wonder if anybody is has any thoughts on those. Thank you. Interesting question. Um, um... I, I personally know some cases where uh, there are some um, prom problem with the visas and, and it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's just purely technical visa cases, um, but um, uh, the government has uh, brought in uh, our other law enforcement rather than immigration uh, like ICE, um, F brought in FBI and things of that nature. And mm -hmm. uh, the person I know the cases, the, the same day, she lost a court appeal and on her way back home uh she was arrested right outside her home uh and she, she wasn't in, in targeted by fbi and before so and i asked a very senior uh, immigration lawyer and it, that lawyer told me things of this almost never happened that somebody just run out of their legal status in this country on the first day and uh, ice is waiting right outside their door uh, to catch her uh, because she was suspected uh, because of her uh, school was a military medical university in China. So they are highly suspicious of uh, people with that kind of background. Mm -hmm. so again, that's, uh, that, that's the only case I know of. I think we had racial profiling here. I was joking a minute ago about Michelle Wu and the mayor's race in Boston, but there was during that campaign, an effort by her opponent to do what a lot of people, including the Boston Globe, thought was racial profiling by suggesting in ads that she was an outsider. And the outsider right. was, um, it was supposedly that she wasn't born in Boston and that right. she had moved here, but it was a lot more than that. And it was using this sense that um, she didn't talk with the proper Boston accent and yeah. that she was somehow not one of us. And I think that that was mm -hmm. a very clear cut case. And so I haven't seen the final numbers, but she was winning by 30%. And I think hopefully um, that will tell some people that just doesn't work anymore um, as an issue, at least here in this case in this time. So Haipei, there's a question that I want to ask. Um, it was actually a joke that was told to me that uh, on one Halloween, uh, a friend wore an old Chinese uh. army jacket. And then, then people are like, hey, wh who are you? You're not Hulk, you're not Shrek. And he said, well, I'm a communist. So the joke was that nothing scares Americans more than a communist. Do you think that is still the case, especially with Biden's administration talking about the ideological divide in the world? Mm -hmm. um, is that warranted? And what is the root of that deep fear? Well, it, it is a bit absurd at this point because you know the Chinese government is hardly like truly communist in in in, in its policies. Um, but I, you know, I do see like rhetoric from uh, congressional Republicans that would call it communist China all the time, and um, the and certainly Trump did that. Um, a, a fair amount. And so, yeah, that is a deliberate, um, a deliberate trope. And the root of it, um, it probably mm -hmm. goes back deeper, but I think the root of it is um, in, there have been a number of red scares throughout American history. Um, the one that 
was most inflamed was just predating Joe McCarthy um, at the end of World War II, and it worked enough. And when McCarthy came along, know nothing, opportunistic Joe McCarthy, all he had to do was grab onto that single issue. And all across America, politicians were being elected on an anti-red platform. The truth is America never had a communist party that numbered more than in the tens of thousands. And it never really threatened to take power, but it was this symbol, it was the easy scapegoat. And it worked well enough then that it's continued to be used. I thought we had outgrown that. I will confess that a week before the 2016 election, I had signed up to write a very different book, not the book on Joe McCarthy, a biography of a guy named Barack Obama. And I had signed up with my publisher, and the week after the election, a story that I thought was a story of ancient history in America, which was demagoguery and red scares, it became clear that that was the story, not just of yesterday, but of today. And I got out of my contract for Obama and got into a contract for Joe McCarthy. And every day that I was working on that book, I had to remind myself whether what I was reading was documents from 70 years ago or from 70 minutes ago, because the story seemed so similar. Wow. Yeah, I had a somewhat similar experience where um, you know, I was writing my book during the Trump administration and uh, uh, watching um, developments kind of with horror. And yeah, it 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 was um, it well, it was unnerving for everyone who who lived through through that period. And one more time, and let me say that uh, UCA, uh, we are not interested in partisan politics. We do not take any position on uh, partisan politics. And uh, we actually have a pretty sophisticated view about the, both parties' strengths and weakness um, in, in, as it relates to Chinese American communities. However, I have to say this, even despite of the fact that I try to run away from politics as far away as possible, that just give a footnote evidence to what Larry just said, that, uh, during the last election cycle, um, every single Republican senatorial candidate had to spend a huge amount of money doing the China thing. Every single one of them, I counted personally. Mm. Because there's only a few senators last time. Uh, and and uh, it, it is really um, uh, scary stuff. And the way they talk about it is, uh, many of them are very very irresponsible to say the least yeah and that made the difference that made a difference in the country yeah we have a question from liu ping Please. yeah go ahead liu ping. uh yes uh, larry i have a question for you i uh, you know i like you mentioned the history uh you mentioned that the hundred books but you uh, add one more. I would definitely read the your one. But I have, uh, I've had no time to read the uh, books on uh, my question before because I'm a, I'm a scientist. You know, the general question I have is, from my knowledge, what I have learned, uh, owning Hitler, the Lazi, and Mao during the Cultural Revolution, who, who chased, he chased and uh, drove scientists away. You know what happened? In my research area, I know five of very, very established scientists left this country permanently in the past two years. So, as uh, you know, as a scientist, I do not understand how, how this have happened with, in this country. You know, we came to this country for two things. One is science, one is freedom. But now we are losing mm -hmm. these two things. Mm -hmm. So as uh, I think you, you may know a lot more than I do because you, you start the history. So that's, that's my general question. So 
all I want to say, I don't know any more, and you're the scientist. Um, as scary as it is, you knew personally scientists who left because of that. When you start multiplying that by the numbers who didn't come during that time, either because they weren't admitted or because this didn't look like a very open place that they wanted to be, those numbers get mm -hmm. scary. That is precisely what we saw in the 1950s. After during World War II, we had been the beneficiary of all the people who were running away from Hitler and all the extraordinary scientists who came to America. Um, lots of people started wondering whether they belonged here because Joe McCarthy made things so unpleasant for them. And I hope that again, the good news part of this story <clears throat> shines through again. It's not that McCarthy existed, which we all know about, it's that we outgrew him and toppled him. And I hope that's what we're going to look back in two years or five years or whatever and say, once again, it looks like demagoguery may be a story of our past and not of our future. And maybe that's naive and too hopeful, but it's because of all of you and because of journalists and people of courage who stand up and say no, not no to a particular partisan interest, but we can all, I hope, get behind saying no to demagogues. Yeah, I too have heard stories of um, scientists, many stories of scientists who have left the United States to go to China or go to other countries um, because the climate has gotten difficult here or because you know other people were investigated at their institution. And that is really the ironic um, uh, effect of all of this that you know it it ends up helping um, the Chinese government's recruitment efforts, which is you know this is the FBI and the DOJ's stated goal is to is to counter um, the the um, growth of uh, Chinese uh, science apparatus and and so you know if they actually end up driving people. Um, back to China, I, I, then you have to question: well, well, Is there is there any utility in um, in all of this? And you know, so I'm, I'm, there are even people. Um, I should say that there are people within the intelligence community who also see a need for reform. Um, you know, people who very much believe that intellectual property theft um, is a threat, but who nonetheless think that, that it, we need to um, reform the China initiative and also change how these investigations are, are uncovered. You know, for people um, in these in intelligence agencies whose job it is to uh, work on counteracting China, um, to them also, the, the news that all of this is driving people back to China is, um, is very bad news. Yeah, my feeling is just kind of like a paradox. You know, uh, politicians think what they, they are doing is completely correct. Okay, then it really reminds us that uh, we will be like the Japanese during the World War II, okay? We will be all in jail, then or, or in the camp. Okay, then who you you should play? You should play uh, Japanese government or U.S. government. You have no you have nowhere to play. You then you just uh, accept the fate. That's something uh, you know. We already become the second class. So next step is enemy, or I don't know. I have no answer. That's why I won't learn from you guys. We heard you, heard you. Uh, uh, well, well, well put it. You know, I'm one of, uh, I guess, like you, I come to this country for its science or social science and for its freedom. And, yeah. uh, and uh, both are in some way in trouble. Um, and anyway, okay, can we go to the next? Can you, can you mute yourself? We can start okay. talking. Okay. Um, my name is Yuyin Kas. I'm from New York. <clears throat> and uh, what I see this one, um, the McCarthyism, the new face in now is a China initiative. And the difference, the very, very big difference is the China initiative redefine 
the spy, as called a non-traditional collector. This is covered extremely broad face. All the student, faculty, whatever, scientist, engineer, if you have a, you are Chinese descendant, you are under this big umbrella, say non-traditional information collector. And by saying that, you are, the generator is not really saying you have to be arrested. When you arrest somebody, go to court, you need evidence. However, you generate this group of people are not trustable. When you generate this, you don't need any evidence. Just to say these are not trustable. So now a lot of company, they are afraid to hire any Chinese people or whatever, because not because they think you are not qualified, not because of discrimination. They just don't want to get in more trouble. And I saw this um, <clears throat> FBI, I even had a, one document say they help university uh, administrative people give them workshop, tell them how to monitor, um, give a surveillance to the Chinese people. Say, you know, if they uh, did anything, somehow you just tell them how to monitor and how to report. And you have to report as, as the, the old institution, their, their, their behavior, their, their, you know. So this is, this is a, I think this is a big problem. Not simply just arrest somebody. Arrest somebody, you need evidence, go to court, okay? But they untrust, it doesn't need any evidence. That's the That's big... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think they got your point, yeah. Really appreciate your uh, very, very good point. A any response? Uh, I guess I would say that this, this, uh, this idea of non-traditional collector goes back to the 1990s, um, if not earlier. And, um, you know, I looked into some of the, the literature that the, that framed like the theory that the FBI was using for Chinese espionage. And the idea of going back decades has been that um, there is a kind of um, army of informal co collectors. Um, the, the actual the actual metaphor was um, you know that if you look at the collection of sand on a beach, um, China would just send all of its people to the beach to each take back a grain of sand, and that they would somehow bring this all back to China, and that it would be you know assembled back into the beach. I mean, this it sounds ridiculous, but um, you know this was actual um, this was the actual theory. Um, uh, among some in some quarters of of, um, of the FBI, and it's highly problematic um, because well, there well there may be some people who who freelance or moonlight as intelligence collectors. Um, it encourages agents to see um, all ethnic Chinese people as um, as suspect, and and you know it of course goes back. It harkens back to um to you know previous um racist theories and ideas so there's a long history there so all i want to say is that nobody ever was convicted or went to jail because of charges that joe mccarthy brought and that is um reminiscent of what's going on today people he didn't care about convicting anybody or putting them in jail he cared about raising his profile and shouting and having people listen, and they did listen. Um, and thankfully, there were courts that eventually acquitted them. But uh, we are uh, coming to the end very soon. Uh, we're just going to be uh, having one or two questions. Uh, and uh, please do a quick ones. Uh, Stephen, I see your hand raised. Stephen is a UCS board member and a founding chairman. Stephen? Larry, it's very nice to learn what you were telling us today. I'm an engineering professor. I'm actually writing a book chapter on racial profiling in academia. So I would very much like to contact you uh, to get some of your background information into my book chapter. But in addition, I want to share with you that um, there was a letter um, written by 177 Stanford faculty members, including eight Nobel lotteries to Attorney General less than two months ago. And it was supported by letters from 214 UC Berkeley professors 
another letter from 169 Temple University professors and 198 Princeton faculty professors. That's 20% of their faculty population. Today, another letter is going to attorney Garner. This is a letter signed by faculty and staff from over 200 universities across the country, including all 50 states and the Washington DC and Puerto Rico, requesting yep. the end of the China initiative. Thank you. Um, Steve, I'll put you together with Larry. Uh, that's easy. So can I just say one quick thing? If this were back in 1950 and Joe McCarthy, he would have taken all those letters and he would have said, it just shows you not that these professors are right, but that they're <laughs> all communists. And that is what he did. And he went after a guy who had been the president of a school called Lawrence University in his hometown of Appleton, Wisconsin. And this guy was named president of Harvard. And when he was at Lawrence, he was okay. When he was at Harvard, he called Harvard Kremlin, the Kremlin on the Charles. And it was wow. the smarter you were and the better university you were at, the more you became a target of his. All right, uh, let's, um, um... Ye Hong, can you be quick? Yeah. Yeah, I have two quick questions. Uh, first, thanks very much for US. Uh, I do that for one. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, no, uh, the China social uh, initiative this seems to launch in uh, very quickly. And like, uh, but the, I bet there's a secret or a coordinated efforts that are leading to that launch. And then relatedly that those people who individual people, they are targeted, they're either, either you know, either cases to crack or they are really strong in the field or they want to target the people who are really strong in the field, seems like uh, from competitor. Uh, but there seems a very limited information out there that reporting this. You know, can you comment on then how the initiative was launched and how those people were targeted? Thank you. Mar, I know nothing uh, about what the coverage has been like. What do you? Sorry, can you explain oh, one I, more time with that? Yeah. I, I know nothing about um, the background on how much coverage has been to the China initiative, um, but you've been at the center of it. The. Yeah, I mean, so. You know, the China Initiative has built on um, years of invest investigations, a kind of informal effort um, by the Justice Department to bring cases connected to China. And I, I think what a, what a lot of media coverage has missed is that there was um, this momentum there previously. It wasn't, um, the China Initiative wasn't some kind of uh, fluke creation of, of, of the Trump administration. Um, it certainly went, went has gone much uh, further than, than what was there before, um, but the the foundation was was already in place. Um, and you know, in 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 the past few months, I've seen a lot of um, interest and a lot of um, um, pretty careful coverage of the initiative um, among colleagues. You know, I, I hate to say that we uh, we need to wrap up here now. Uh, I, I see a long list of uh, hands are there. Uh, some many of them are my friends. I want to apologize. We won't have uh, time uh, to do this today. Uh, really appreciate your being here with us. And this is a huge issue and uh, an issue that's going to be with us for, as I said, a long, long, long time to come. And we could even get worse. And so we need all be prepared. And thanks so much again. Uh, for Mara and uh, Larry, uh, you, you are the lights to our life. Um, and um, we need you. Uh, we really need every bit of help we can find. Um, so the best we can do is to buy some books from you both. I have ordered uh, Larry's uh, Demagogue. Um, uh, it should be somewhere in my home. I haven't been back home for quite a few days now, but I have uh, carried with me uh, uh, Mara's book, A Science and the Spy. Um, uh, I'm in Boston now and uh, I have that book in, in my backpack. Uh, that just tells me how 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 much I, I view that book, 
And today's event is uh, is uh, is a great co collaboration between United Chinese America and uh, and our sister a great partner organizations uh, called U.S. Heartland uh, China Association. It's a wonderful, wonderful, amazing groups are doing a lot of uh, tough job in the heartland of this country. And technically, uh, it, I want to thank Xiao Xiao and uh, Qi Hong for your great work on this. Um, but most importantly, uh, actually, we're missing one person called Zhang Juan, Juan Zhang. Uh, she has been doing most of the, the groundwork, uh, contacting uh, Mara and uh, Larry, and did a lot of work. Uh, Jen, I want to give you a applaud of the hands and uh, thank you again for that. And so we will give uh, our distinguished governor, um, Bob Holden, the last word. Well, hi, Pei. Th thank you very, very much. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all the participants, those that asked the questions and those that gave the answer. Throughout the entire discussion, I kept thinking about if we could take and boil down into a 30 minute, 45 minute uh, overview of the discussion and had that displayed in every one of the schools, elementary schools across the country, they would have a much different understanding maybe of the discussion that we're having today and the problems we as a nation are having. Uh, because that's that's where we've got to get to. We've got to get to the uh, future generation of leaders and let them know there is a different path than what the, some of these people that Larry and, and Mar talked about today. And I want to applaud everybody that participated, everybody that's engaged, but now is not the time to declare victory. Now is the time to think about how do we move forward and how do we develop the foundation so thoughtful discussion can once again be, be occurring in our culture and so good public policy can be drafted, made, and exercised because it's in not only our future as a nation, it's the world's future. Uh, and we've got to figure out how to, to make this uh, sink into the minds and the hearts of people across uh, our world. I've been active for over 40 years with the American Legion uh, Boy State and Girl State program in Missouri. For the first time in the history of that organization, 80 some odd years, I convinced them to send a group of students to China. And we received a group of students from China into the Girl State and Boy State program. That does a tremendous amount of educating on the really the things that you've been talking about all day today. It allows us and them to see each other as human beings. One of the kind of side notes, uh, I found out a few years ago that a young, uh, a gentleman I know married a, a woman in China, brought her back to the United States along with her, her children. And a couple years later, one of the girls got selected to go to Missouri Girl State. And she got put up by the, the Girl State people as being uh, their candidate for governor. She got elected mm -hmm. as her candidate for governor. And then they found out that she wasn't even an American citizen. That tells you that if you connect with the right people, good results will happen. And your work today, your comments today, helps build that connection across our country and to the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much for all of it. That's uh, the end of our program today. Hope we'll do more of this uh, nature. And thanks again, everybody, for attending this event today. And especially thanks goes to Mara and Larry. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for hosting us. Goodbye. Thank you for hosting. And read Larry's. <laughs>